In this lesson, we're going to learn how to locate the epicenter of an earthquake. Earthquake problems. Okay, you need to open your reference table to page 11. By now, you should have downloaded a copy of the Earth Science Reference Table to the desktop of your PC. Check the desktop to see if it's there. If it's not, you want to Google Earth Science Reference Table New York State Regents Exam and one of the first or second things that comes up will give you something that you can download as a PDF file and make sure it's the 2010 version. Okay so this is the earthquake P wave and S wave travel time chart it's on page 11 of your earth science reference tables. Look down here at the bottom where it says epicenter distance times 10 to the third kilometers. Down here you have the distance so for example with a P wave it takes a certain amount of time to travel the distance. The further away you are the longer it's going to take. So on the left side over here it says travel time in seconds. So this tells you how long the earthquake has traveled, how much time, and on the bottom it tells you how much distance. So for example with the P wave to go 6,000 kilometers, here's your 6 right here times 10 to the third, bring that up, that's where it intersects the P wave. Now you bring that over and you can see it's slightly more than 9 seconds. The distance from Albany, New York to the epicenter of this earthquake is 5,600 kilometers. Approximately how much longer did it take for the S wave to arrive at Albany than the P wave. Well to do this problem we need to use our earthquake P wave and S wave travel time chart which is in your reference tape. So I'm going to bring that up now. Now now, here's the good news. You will definitely be tested on this on the Regents exam. This is part of your earth science lab practical. So you absolutely must know how to use this chart. So let's take a look at it. Down at the bottom, see where it says epicenter distance. And that's in thousands of kilometers. Okay, and then you see these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Each one of those is 1,000. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Now between these, there's four little lines which divide it into five little boxes. So if you divide 1,000 kilometers by five, you get 200. So each little box is 200 kilometers. So for example, between 5 and 6 would be 5,000 kilometers, 5,200, 400, 600, 800, 6,000 kilometers. Well, we want 5,600 kilometers. I'm pointing to it right now. Now you go up that line to where it intersects with the P wet line and the S line. See that? That's the P line, and up there, that's the S line. You go over to the Y axis, and the Y axis is how long it took for a P wave to travel that distance. So for the P wave to go 5,600 kilometers, it takes nine minutes. For an S wave to travel 5,600 kilometers, it takes 16 minutes and 10 seconds. So the question is, approximately how much longer did it take the S wave? So if you were in Albany, and the P wave arrived, how much longer did you wait until the S wave arrived? Okay, so what's 16 minutes and 10 seconds minus 9 minutes? That's 7 minutes and 10 seconds. That's your answer. Okay, so let's try a problem. If an observer is a thousand kilometers from the epicenter, how long will it take the P wave to reach the observer? Well, one times ten to the third kilometers is a thousand. So I start from the one, I go up, and then I come over, and it sh it's going to take me two minutes and ten seconds. How long will it take the S wave to travel a thousand kilometers? Again, we're at the one, so we continue to go up to the S wave and then we come over from the S wave and we can see that it will take an S wave four minutes. So this is how we're able to determine how far we are from an earthquake and also ultimately where the earthquake is. Take a look at this. A P wave arrives at 12 noon. You see it on your seismograph. The first S wave arrives at 12.05, five minutes later. So how, are, how far are you from the epicenter? 
Simple problem. We take out our reference table and we're going to determine how far you have to be for the S wave to arrive five minutes after the P wave. Okay, so the first thing I do is I go to the left of my scale and I measure five minutes. And then I slide that along until the difference between the P and the S wave is exactly five minutes. And you can see I've done that here, and that's at 3.8 times 10 to the third kilometers. So at 3.8 times 10 to the third kilometers, it would take an S wave five minutes longer to arrive than a P wave. This tells me that I am 3,800 kilometers away from the epicenter of the earthquake. Suppose a P and S wave arrive six minutes apart. What is your distance from the epicenter? So to do this question, I measure out six minutes on the scale, and then I slide that along to find where the distance difference in time between the P wave arrival and the S wave arrival is six minutes. And as you can see, I've done that here, and that is at 4.6 times 10 to the third kilometers, or 4,600 kilometers. So if it, you are 4,600 kilometers away from an epicenter, the S wave will arrive six minutes after the P wave. Okay, so if the travel time for the P wave is seven minutes and 30 seconds, and the P wave arrived at your station at three hours, 21 minutes and 15 seconds. What time did the earthquake occur? So you set this problem up in this way. You put the 3, 21, 15, and you subtract seven minutes and 30 seconds. So 20, three hours, 21 minutes and 15 seconds minus seven, hour, seven minutes and 30 seconds. So what you do is obviously 15 seconds, you can't take away 30 seconds, so you take a minute away from 21. So 60 seconds is a minute, plus 15 is 75. So you have 75 seconds minus 30 seconds, you're gonna get 45 seconds, and then 20 minutes minus seven minutes, you're gonna get 13 minutes. And so the answer is three hours, 13 minutes, and 45 seconds. You are 4,000 kilometers away from the epicenter of an earthquake. How long will it take the first P wave to arrive? Use your reference table, page 11. You start at 4,000 kilometers, you go up to the P wave, you go over, and you see that it takes seven minutes. Now you continue to go up to the S wave, you go over to the time, and you can see that it takes 12 minutes and 40 seconds. A seismic station 4,000 kilometers from the epicenter of an earthquake records the arrival time of the first P wave at 10 hours, 0 minutes, and 0 seconds. At what time did the first S wave arrive at this station? All right, so let's turn to our P and S wave chart in your Earth Science reference tables. Okay, so here's the P and S wave chart, and I've just highlighted where 4,000 kilometers would be, and here's where the P wave would arrive. Now, you can see that that's seven minutes after the earthquake, but we don't really care about that. The point is, it arrived at 10 o'clock, zero minutes, zero seconds. Now, if we go up from here, we can see that one, two, three, four, five minutes and 40 seconds later, the S wave will arrive. So the correct answer is 5 minutes and 40 seconds after 10 o'clock, 0 minutes, 0 seconds, or 10, 05, 40. Okay, so now we've seen that using a seismograph, we can figure out how far we are from an earthquake. And therefore, if you had one seismograph location, you could draw a circle, and you note somewhere on that circle that you're going to find the earthquake. If you had two seismograph stations, you draw two circles, and they would intersect in two spots. So you've now narrowed the possible location of that earthquake to two spots. But if you have a third seismograph station, those three will intersect in a single spot. That's why it takes us three seismograph stations to locate where the earthquake was. And this process is called triangulation. You may be familiar with that term if you've watched any movies. This dynamic earth, the story of plate tectonics. The word dynamic means that the earth is active, it's moving, it's living. If the earth were not active and moving and living, it would not be able to support life. So we believe that Mars, very similar to the earth, 
the right distance from the sun, the right size, used to be a dynamic planet. And at that time, it probably had life on it. But now, Mars is a dead planet, and there is no longer any life. So we will discuss that. So the theory of plate tectonics is that, according to the theory, the outer layer of the Earth is broken up into large, brittle plates of rock that float on warmer, soft rock below. Alfred Wagner, in 1912, proposed the theory of continental drift. He believed that the Earth was once a giant landmass which split apart to form separate continents. Okay, so you need to know evidence for continental drift. The first one is the jigsaw fit of the continents. If you put the continents back together, it looks like they fit together like pieces of a puzzle. The second one is that once you do put the continents back together, the mountain ranges and the rock strata line up. So you can see that before there was a mountain that ran right between these two continents, and then when it split, the mountain split in half. Part of the theory of continental drift is that at one time, all of the continents were all together into a single large landmass, and we call that Pangaea. The reason we call it Pangaea is because, in Greek, that means all land. So it's a landmass in which all the continents were there. Okay, so this slide shows you how the Earth world looked 250 million years ago with Pangaea. All the continents were together. Then if you move to the right, you see Laurasia on the top and Gondwana land on the bottom. So basically, the, those top two continents, North America and Asia, split off from the rest of the continents. Then they broke up into all the separate little continents, and then as the world is today. Okay, so that's the progression we've seen over the last 250 million years. Okay, I mentioned this earlier, but similar rock strata have been found on separate continents. So in this example, when we put South America and Africa together, we find that we have a rock strata that's 550 million years old, pretty much the same rock strata on both continents. So obviously when that formed, there was no ocean separating these two continents. Now another very exciting piece of evidence was that similar fossils are found on separate continents. Now these are little creatures that do not swim. So we find creatures that don't swim, could not swim across the Atlantic Ocean, and they existed in the same region of Africa and South America. So how could they have evolved separately like that, unless Africa and South America were one time joined together? So what are the plates sitting on? The Earth has approximately 12 tectonic plates that sit on top of the asthenosphere. Now the asthenosphere, it lies upon the upper mantle. It's a plastic layer. By that we mean it has the ability to flow like honey. So the theory is that convection currents within the mantle are the reason for continental drift. We think the center of the Earth is very hot due to radioactive decay, and this heat bubbles up as convection currents, and these convection currents move the continents. All right, so let's talk about the types of plate boundaries. First, we're going to look at these two, convergent and divergent. So convergent plate boundary means that the plates are moving towards each other. Okay, so a conversion plate boundary is when two plates are coming together. So what happens when two plates collide? We can get a subduction zone if oceanic crust, basalt, collides with continental crust, which is granite. The heavier, denser oceanic crust will subduct, plunge beneath the continental crust. Oceanic crust mafic igneous rocks subducts beneath the continental crust which are felsic igneous rocks. So what happens if continental crust collides with continental crust? Well when two plates of the same material granite and therefore the same density collide one will not subduct beneath the other but instead the crust will be forced upwards forming mountains. 
So one example of two continents colliding is the Himalaya Mountains. As you can see, left on the ocean floor are these skid marks where India has collided, slid right into Asia, and the collision has resulted in the Himalaya Mountains. Okay, so the second type of plate boundary we mentioned was a divergent plate boundary. This is where plates are moving away from each other. Okay, so what this animation shows is that the continent begins to split apart. And once it starts to split apart, we call that a rift zone. And it gets low enough to where all of a sudden the ocean water will flood in and then it will become a new ocean basin. So a divergent plate boundary gives birth to the MOR. MOR stands for Mid-Ocean Ridge. In the middle of each ocean, there's a ridge. That's where the oceans split apart, and it's continuing to split apart. And, of course, the oceans filled, filled this thing up. All right, so just remember, MOR stands for Mid-Ocean Ridge, and a ridge is a divergent plate boundary. What kind of plate boundary is shown? This is a divergent plate boundary. What you should do is look up here at these arrows and how they're pointing away from each other, and that's how you know it's a divergent plate boundary. Okay, the youngest rock is found at the point of divergence, and as the, uh, the sea floor spreads apart, you, get, you continually get new rock being born or created, and the further you get from the MOR, the mid-ocean ridge, the older the rock becomes. It's like going on a conveyor belt. So the oldest ocean rock is going to be the ocean rock that's closest to the continents, and the youngest ocean rock is the rock right there in the middle of the ocean. Okay, this is page 5 of the Earth Science Reference Table. So if I asked you what kind of fault is the San Andreas Fault, you'd find it on your map, and I've circled it. And then you would come down to the key, and you'd see that when the arrows are going by each other, that's called a transform fault.